Hello, and welcome to this COPE webinar on standards in authorship. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're starting a new educational webinar series as part of COPE's 20th anniversary celebrations. And this is actually COPE's first ever webinar. So if you stay to the end of the hour, you'll have the privilege of saying you contributed to COPE history. I hope you're ready to type questions in the question box and to take part in a few polls along the way. Today, we have three guest speakers who will offer a wide range of perspectives because, of course, authorship is a complex topic. I'm your moderator and my name is Trevor Lane. I volunteer as a co council member and I'm the Education Director for Edance Group, an editing and publishing support company based in Japan. First to speak will be Deborah Poff, who is COPE's Vice Chair and the Editor-in-Chief of several publications, including the Journal of Academic Ethics. Deborah lives in Canada and most recently was the Vice President for Strategic Development at Pacific Coast University for Workplace Health Sciences. Next up will be Kelly Kobe, a Senior Clinical Research Associate and Publications Officer at Ottawa Hospital Research Institute in Canada. She's also an adjunct professor in the School of Epidemiology at the University of Ottawa. Then we'll hear from Liz Allen, the Director of Strategic Initiatives at F1000, which provides publishing services for biomedical researchers. Liz joins us from the UK and was previously the Head of Evaluation at the Wellcome Trust and a Board Director of ORCID. She's currently a Co-Chair of Project Credit. So welcome Deborah, Kelly and Liz and thanks for agreeing to be our first COPE webinar speakers. Now, why is authorship important? Well, it documents who made a substantial contribution to the work. It comes with moral and legal rights, including copyright. It signals accountability and it affects decisions in hiring, tenure, promotions, funding and prizes and awards. So these days, multiple first authors and multiple corresponding authors aren't unusual. Authorship is indeed getting more complex. Groups are getting bigger, up to thousands in particle physics, and authors cross geographies and disciplines. But authorships seem to depend on different cultures and conventions of institutions, disciplines, journals, and countries. It's no wonder that of the one-fifth of COPE forum cases that are authorship related, most are to do with author disputes, for example, over author order or people claiming to be missed off the author list. COPE forum tries to offer guidance and you can find all our cases in the COPE resource webpage. By the way, please do join us in our next COPE forum, which will be on the 24th of July. COPE also has a guideline document on solving author disputes, plus flowcharts on handling unethical authorship and requests for authorship changes. There's an e-learning authorship module in the COPE members webpage, and we have a discussion document on what constitutes authorship, which will be revised based on today's discussion and your online feedback. So we encourage you to read it and leave comments. Now, relevant things to authorship standards that you'll hear today are ORCID, which issues unique identifiers so researchers can be linked to their professional activities. There's credit or contributor roles taxonomy of CASRI. That's a standardized list of research contributions. And probably the most well-known authorship guidelines are from the ICMJE, originally for medical journals. So my question for the panel to think about is can we or should we standardize authorship across disciplines? But for now, I'd like to invite Deborah to tell us about publishing in the humanities and social sciences. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I know we're covering a lot of time zones. I was asked to, uh, to speak about issues, authorship issues in the humanities and social sciences. I have edited in my career four different journals 
and all of them spanned from the uh, at one end of the humanities, philosophy, religious studies, um, history, descriptive history, literary criticism, so that end of the spectrum, through schools of business and all the disciplines that are uh, represented there, and uh, finally to more frequently published social science areas in psychology, sociology, and economics. So I think I have a kind of broad perspective, and uh, most of us know have been involved in research ethics, research integrity, and publication um, ethics. Is there's a there's a bit of a gap and a bit of underrepresentation, particularly with respect to the humanities discipline, and even to a certain extent um, in the social sciences. And in fact, there's even an antipathy in some quarters to discussing research ethics, research integrity and publication ethics, and I think it's important for COPE to seriously commit to addressing those gaps, and certainly COPE is, uh, is trying to be more proactive in that area um, currently. So I think the first issue we need to address is that people talk about the humanities and social sciences as if they somehow belong together and as if they had uh, common uh, problems, and I really think that's part of the problem, that there's a real distinction between what goes on in the humanities, particularly with respect to ethical issues and what goes on in the empirical um, areas of the social sciences. And in fact, they're, they're radically other. If you look at the humanities, um, it's important that you realize that almost all articles, and wherever you make a claim, there's always a counterexample to deal with, but uh, with the humanities, generally, most articles and most uh, full-length monographs are single-authored. Um, thesis supervision expectation in the humanity uh, are generally that you will supervise graduate students and undergraduate students' theses, as well as doctoral theses, but there's generally no expectation of authorship on the part of the supervisor or the members of the supervisory committee. And certainly that's been my career. I've had a number of master students and PhD students, and that was my job to make sure that they produced the best research that they could. But generally, it would be thought of as unethical in the humanities to consequently have your name on a um, on a publication of, from a student you supervise. So in uh, humanities, and this is basically the last thing I'm going to say about the humanities, but I think we need to address their concerns, is that ethical issues are generally not about authorship because they are sole authored, primarily, publications. There are The problems, the ethical uh, issues you do find in humanities are sometimes excessive self-citation, which I think comes about because a lot of uh, humanists see themselves as uh, building throughout their career on essentially the same problem. A number of philosophers do that, for example, so they write uh, they write a research paper, and the paper gets cited in a longer research paper, and that gets cited in yet uh, the next monograph, which et cetera, et cetera. So there tends to be a kind of insularity in terms of self-citation that can be problematic. Of course, there's also plagiarism, which happens in all disciplines. Redundant publications um, is kind of a family um, um, similarity between excessive self-citation problem. And there's a problem in the humanities in uh, um, lack of, of citation amnesia, perhaps, in what's known as res received wisdom. If you're, if you're talking about uh, ideas that uh, go back to antiquity, uh, a lot of people think they don't necessarily have to continue to quote the source of those ideas. So there can, there can be a problem of um, citation amnesia. So the social sciences, the similarities are more um, more frequently recognized as similar to the sciences generally. Uh, there's been considerable work on research integrity and publication ethics and authorship among professional or organizations, and most frequently, uh, the American Psychological Association, the American Sociological Association, the Canadian counterparts. Uh, they are the probably the most um, similar to some of the natural sciences and particularly to empirical work where you use either human participants in the research or you use uh, animals. Um, so there is family resemblance within the social sciences and there are, fa there are sort of authorship norms, although again they do have exceptions. So generally speaking in the social sciences, it's been my experience that authors 
gen frequently are listed alphabetically, and when that practice is followed, you are to assume that um, everybody is equally participating in the research. If the order is different, then you are supposed to count the authorial le leadership in terms of uh, who's first author, who's second article, author, et cetera. And in some disciplines, for example, in the American Psychological Association's guideline, they, uh, they explicitly state with respect to journal articles that are based on a thesis or a dissertation that the student will be the first author, and if they're not, there has to be an explanation of why that's the case. Social sciences generally, certainly more than physics, but also more than many of the natural sciences or physical sciences, have a smaller number of authors per research project. Although this can vary, there are some very large centers of excellence and large multidisciplinary teams doing empirical survey research around the world, and they can have quite large teams, although usually the um, not, as, not as much as some of the, some of the natural sciences or physical sciences. And with respect to the social sciences overall, from my experience as an editor-in-chief and from my research in the field, most authorship disputes arise from not clearly stipulating authorship roles prior to engaging in the research or because of interpersonal conflict that arises between the co-investigators or members of the team. And I've had some really ugly um, uh, article problems that I had to deal with in terms of investigation in one case where uh, the two leads, the two co-authors, uh, basically had a falling out and one took the data and submitted the publication to one of my journals without saying that uh, he had conducted the research with someone else. And then it was published and it was quite a mess. Uh, with respect to clarity and transparency about authorial roles, guidelines like the ICMJE or the American Psycholo Psychological Association are helpful in identifying the substantive roles that must be present for ascribing authorship within the social sciences, and particularly with respect to students, but also for the sake of all researchers in a project, the best practice of identifying roles and responsibilities in writing uh, with agreement is crucial to avoiding disputes later. And as somebody who's involved, has been involved for a few years with COPE, uh, we've had a few fairly significant complaints from uh, prior PhD students who uh, believed that their supervisor had stolen their research and published articles in both cases that where this was uh, a fairly significant complaint. Uh, the universities in question had done thorough investigations and found, it, found the, their claims to be without uh, credibility and the students had assumed that was part of the collusion of the university against them and consequently writ, uh, wrote to, uh, to COPE uh, hoping that we could intercede. And I think it tells you the complexity of, of the relationship between supervisors and students in uh, a lot of empirical work. So given the unique factors in some social science research, there are, oh yes, this is, sorry, this is a very different point. There are some very unique factors, cultural factors in some social science research. And they actually um, are a bit contrary to our understanding of the norms of publishing. So for example, in many Aboriginal communities, uh, there's a requirement that all members of the community become authors in the research. Uh, it's about a sensitivity of that appropriation of uh, traditional knowledge. And those communities not only say they will be authors of any research that's done with the community, but they also sign uh, um, agreements, protocols that say, they can actually veto the publication if they decide the findings are harmful to the communities. This, this is obviously unique. It comes with um, particular problems for authorship and publication ethics. And it's also not unique to Aboriginal research. It's also uh, a factor in, an, in research with a number of vulnerable populations. Uh, for example, people who are stigmatized because of certain so uh, what's the relationship between journals and institutions during investigations? Well, reasonably and for legal and labor relation factors, universities uh, conduct investigations with respect to misconduct. And this can be a very long and protracted process given everybody's uh, um, rights and responsibilities in their employment. And it, it can lead to a, an issue with journals either making interim process announcements or trying to make decisions independent of the university investigations. I can have the next slide. Oh, 
So, uh, so I think that COPE is engaged with a very interesting pilot project, and in fact, the next speaker will is part of that pilot at the University of Ottawa. We are trying, while we respect as an organization, we certainly respect the autonomy of university governance, we are in a test pilot mode with respect to creating a category of university membership in COPE. And we hope that among other things, this will lead to enhanced common educational practices on publication ethics issues, including an appreciation of this distinct issues for diff different disciplines and common understanding of the role and importance of journals in knowledge dissemination and the protection of research integrity with a mutual understanding of how this matters to universities. So thank you very much. And with respect to uh, Trevor's question about standardization, I think my discussion in, uh, in many ways spoke to uh, um, the lack of standardization and perhaps a number of disciplines uh, from across the humanities and social sciences, but there's certainly some um, common foundational principles that I think can be standardized. It can be a norm for us all. So thanks very much. Now I'm going to hand over to Kelly. Now Deborah mentioned COPE is interested in hearing from institutions. So uh, at this point, um, Kelly's going to tell us about what academic institutions are doing or should be doing about authorship practices and education. Hi there, it's nice to connect with you all. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking about authorship considerations from the perspective of research institutions. And specifically, I'll address why authorship matters to institutions and what support institutions themselves and researchers may need to promote good authorship practice. So to get started, I think we can ask the question, why do institutions care about authorship? There may be many reasons institutions value authorship, but from my experience and perspective, I think there are two key contributors. The first is that authorship confers credit and institutions use publications as a metric to highlight their academic productivity and achievement of impact. Uh, so the number of publications is a commonly reported uh, metric comparing both between and within institutions. And I think institutions stress the importance of staff correctly acknowledging their academic affiliations on their publications so that they can get credit for the work their institute members are publishing. And the advent of ORCID has filled a need for institutions uh, which are looking to keep comprehensive records of what their researchers have actually authored. And I just want to say that while considering number of publications as a metric for success is a common practice for institutions, there's actually little evidence based to support the notion that the quantity of publications authored relates to quality or impact in any way. Uh, so beyond using authorship or publications as an assay to output, I think a second reason why research institutions care about authorship is that they uh, play an important role in supporting their researchers throughout the research process, which includes the publication and dissemination phases of research. Uh, institutions want to keep their researchers happy and they benefit from clarifying what it means to be an author through the implementation of things like internal authorship policies or guidelines. So that when authorship conflicts arise, uh, and these take a lot of energy and time to mediate, um, and can be quite negative, I think, for uh, all involved in the experience, uh, they have firm policies and guidelines that they can use to help moderate the situation. However, uh, with that said, I think that uh, institutional authorship policies, uh, it's really important that they uh, adequately reflect the different disciplines within the institution and that they consider things like student supervisor relationships, uh, employer staff relationships, and other uh, related issues like uh, the instances of industry and international collaboration, which may impact upon authorship. In my view, uh, failure to make policies explicit can actually lead to further frustration uh, or confusion from researchers since the policies are ultimately not very usable to them. So based on a desire to avoid authorship uh, conflicts, I think institutions pay to invest in authorship policies and have proactive outreach. But uh, such outreach and policies don't already exist at many institutions. And I think that one reason why institutions may fail in their remit to support researchers uh, and provide this type of guidance uh, to them is that uh, they don't actually have a lot of support 
or outreach in creating these types of documents. And I think COPE can help address this uh, gap, for instance, through the pilot project we're initiating. I know uh, as someone who studies publication science that the field is changing quite rapidly and it may be difficult for research institutions and administrators to keep pace with the changes. Uh, these individuals may not be trained in the area of publication practice or they may not know where to look for emerging changes. And institutions themselves, uh, they tend to be risk averse and they may not want to proactively update their policies or make changes where they lack confidence in what they're doing. So I think uh, through consensus statements or in particular disciplines, uh, template policies for institutions and outreach materials could be very beneficial. Uh, while research institutions uh, have a stake in clarifying authorship to their researchers and ensuring authorship best practice, in my experience, institutions rarely have active training around authorship. And I think this is very problematic because most uh, training on authorship and indeed publication ethics more broadly, uh, these are skills that are learned on the job, often from a PhD mentor. Uh, I understand that in, in many instances and uh, at various institutions, research integrity officers, certainly at least in the Canadian setting, um, they're spread very thinly and that their role tends to be very reactive rather than proactive. So it may be that standard training materials or templates could be developed uh, via COPE and shared to support those acting in these and related roles such as scholarly librarian positions. Uh, the situation is certainly likely to vary between countries and even within countries and disciplines. So I think the establishment of networks where these don't already exist uh, for research integrity officers could be really beneficial so that we're not duplicating effort and that we're sharing resources. Just very briefly, I'll say as well that uh, in my role at the Ottawa Hospital, I serve as a publications officer. And essentially, this is a dedicated role to support researchers who are trying to get published. And it's really related to all aspects of publishing. And I offer uh, outreach uh, and also one on one consulting. And one of the most frequent consult topics I receive does pertain to authorship. And I think, um, as Deborah mentioned, it often surrounds the fact that folks don't agree ahead of time the expectations or clarify expectations surrounding authorship. Uh, in general, I think having a dedicated staff member at an institution to provide this type of consultation and outreach uh, on these topics uh, may be really uh, helpful for institutions to proactively address authorship issues before they actually move downstream to become issues at journals. And of course, uh, I think the, the role is very positive and has been well received, but this isn't something that comes for free. It does require investment on the part of the institution. Um, just to summarize, I feel that uh, institutions could be more active and that they need to have more of a seat at the table to discuss and contribute to topics surrounding ethical authorship. So, uh, for example, institutions may want to take a more active role in contributing to the rollout of interventions related to authorship. So as an example, uh, the credit author uh, contributorship taxonomy, uh, which will be spoke about by the next speaker in greater detail, um, is something that's been rolled out. And I think that institutions uh, could be a great place for it to be promoted and where researchers could be educated about this and that um, the rollout of such interventions ultimately has an impact upon research institutions because uh, these types of interventions may be relevant for decisions pertaining to things like hiring and tenure and promotion if we're going to continue to use uh, authorship as a metric for gauging success. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I think that uh, along with authorship comes important responsibilities and that research institutions have an obligation to support their employees in ensuring uh, publication and authorship best practice. And I think that uh, there's much room for improvement and more could be done proactively rather than reactively uh, at the institutional level uh, in order to develop structures to support that this occurs. So that's uh, all I have for now. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think hopefully my talk will Think nicely with what's gone before. Um, particularly, I'd like to echo what Kelly said around institutions and other players other than publishers really getting involved in 
discussions around authorship and credit and contributions to research. Okay, so I just wanted to talk. So I have a funding background. I used to work at the Wellcome Trust before I joined F1000 a year and a half ago. I was dealing with evaluation of research outputs. So one of the key things that research evaluators need to do in a similar way to how Kelly just described at institutions is to consider how the people that they might fund on grants or um, as part of a research team or indeed employ, how might they find out a bit more about what research they've been involved in or contributed to and sort of think about who the best people might be for certain roles that a funding agency might want to engage with them in. Um, at the moment at F1000, I'm now working very much around open science and open research. And again, the key thing there is about making research outputs more easily available, shared. And one of the key pieces of information is who's been involved in specific bits of research. And so that you can track that, you can find out who they are. And there are a lot of practical benefits um, in addition to some of the things that Deborah and Trevor and Kelly have talked about. So the problems, as, as, as has already been said by the previous speakers, that problems with authorship are really well established. Um, from a research evaluation point of view, the notion of an author has never really captured um, what research evaluators are really trying to do. Um, and it's all around contributions to research is what the key thing is, who's been responsible for certain aspects. And the term authorship itself in a way that the, we think about research outputs is a, in terms of just articles is, is also quite an outdated concept. So I think it's definitely time that we started to think about something new, which is partly where the concepts of credit came from. But the problems around authorship are certainly not new and they've been talked about moving things beyond that for some time. This is another thing, another slide that I've used many times. Um, it's quite tongue in cheek, but it's pretty accurate in terms of a lot of the way, particularly in the life sciences, authorship lists really do not convey the reality of who has contributed what to particular pieces of research. Um, and there are two changes afoot. One, I think, it, particularly in research outputs, and probably more so in the life sciences and perhaps the social sciences too, that the concept of a research output being an article, and that's the sole thing that is the key output of research, is changing. Um, that the currency of publishing an article in a journal was one of the key ways a researcher communicated their findings in the past, but that is definitely changing the number of outlets for researchers to share different aspects of their work and not necessarily in a highly crafted article are definitely shifting. And that therefore also changes the concepts of the word author and the concept of what an author really is. Um, and going alongside that, in research evaluation as in, in institutions, the currency of that article as the main thing that a researcher would have to talk about to get their promotion, to get their grant, to get their tenureship um, is also changing alongside that. So we really do need to think about things a little bit differently. Um, this is some data that was published on a PLOS related blog. It's data from the PLOS journals. Um, the, the scales on the left on the, on the y-axis are slightly different, they're slightly misleading, but essentially what it shows is across all the disciplinary areas in the PLOS journal, so you can see it covers computational biology as well as PLOS one, which is considered a kind of mega journal, although it is kind of related to health in some ways, you can see that the number of lone or, so, lone or sole authors has, has rapidly um, declined. This is the number of authors on papers in, in those journals over the last 10 years really. So you can see that the trend is upwards. So we do need to sort of rethink this a little bit. We should never, in, from a research evaluation point of view, it really always used to irk me that we would use um, author position as any real indication um, that was consistently useful across different disciplines to indicate who had actually done what and, and all the kinds of things that they things that they'd contributed to in, in, in a crafted article. It, it did, never really made an awful lot of sense. But as I mentioned, the currency of an article was one of the sole things that uh, in the past research evaluators were able to kind of point to to say that a researcher had produced output. But as I mentioned, that is changing. Um, and the reality is that actually we could do a lot more to find out what people had actually practically contributed to the research that's being described either in articles or in other places. Um, this slide shows the different use cases um, for why you might want to know about um, contributions to research. So you can see 
some of the issues around accountability um, and from the publisher's point of view a lot of a lot of conflicts that journals deal with are around author disputes um, but there are a number of practical I prefer to see things in a very practical sense there are a number of reasons why research funders and institutions want to know more about who's done what on, on, in research um, you know to, to find the right people to potentially work with to fund um, to support collaborations um, to support them in terms of thinking about new grant applications identifying peer reviewers there are a real number of practical reasons that if we had better information and metadata around who's contributed to specific research outputs we would know much more um, about how to make science potentially more sci more scientific and more efficient and more effective and linking to things like ORCID is a key thing in terms of building the infrastructure where we can connect researchers to their outputs much better. The credit taxonomy itself, um, it, as I mentioned, it's not a new concept, but um, there was a workshop. I was initially working, I was working at the Wellcome Trust and my colleague Amy Brand um, was based at Harvard on a tenure in a tenureship role at that point in 2011. And she'd had some discussions with the ICMJE editors who also had, um, I think Ginny Barber was the lead at that point, um, where there was a discussion, let's see if we can bring the multi-sector meeting together to sort of consider some of these issues. And this is where the credit taxonomy came from. Um, following that meeting in Harvard in 2011, there was a draft taxonomy developed. Um, and then there was a pilot done with a number of journals where we asked recent corresponding authors what they thought about using a structured taxonomy as opposed to a more free text um, descriptor of who'd done what. Um, and then that taxonomy was then posted and, and it's now been kind of Kazari is the custodian of credit. It sits on their website. Um, there's a dictionary that has the list of terms and they're encouraging people to use it, but also to provide feedback on where there might need to be um, trends and, and changes. Um, I think one of the things that I've always had in my head is that the kind of words that, you know, perfection can be the enemy of the good and to try to have one size fits all might not be the right solution. But most of the credit taxonomy um, terms at the moment seem to be fairly robustly uh, cover authorship contributions or contributions in life sciences. Um, it was tested particularly in the life sciences, but there are definitely term terms that can be used across other disciplines. And um, if we're trying to make a practical standard, we have to be careful not to make things 100% perfect at the expense of being able to use something and get on with things. This is the, this is the credit taxonomy as it stands. As I mentioned, it's on the Casare website and the links are on the slides. I'll, I'll make sure that the slides are available to everybody. Um, so the high level terms are on the left side. There are 14 terms um, and the right side has the definitions of those terms. And I think when we were con conceiving of, of, the, of this, we imagined that the descriptors could be made sufficiently broad to accommodate more disciplines if you start to think about going beyond the life sciences. There are others, so one of the things that um, has been suggested recently to me and, and to others is having something around where now peer reviewers are actually contributing in open peer review models, peer reviewers are actually providing a real role to helping researchers move their work forward. So maybe we should start to think about um, having peer review as a kind of a role here, um, but, but I'm not sure that's in there yet. But that's what I'm, what I'm trying to say essentially is that this is something that's possibly a movable feast. We have something that works potentially now, but research outputs and research is, is, is and the way people do research and share it is changing so rapidly this is something that would not stand still and just to finish what's been happening since we since we have posted the taxonomy with cred with Kazari, we've been encouraging um different organizations and I, i'm not the problem the, one of the challenges that credit has faced is that it's never really had a home it's been a community kind of led um, initiative that Amy and I particularly um, drove and we had lots of champions who helped us with that but it's sitting with Kazari it hasn't specifically got a lead um, and, and this is a problem both Amy and I have now moved to different jobs um, there's lots of advocates um, of the of the taxonomy and people encourage encouraging people to make have better metadata around around the research articles so that is so embarrassing that's my front door that is now going to be on your webinar um, but yeah, essentially people are now using the system and, and, and implementing it in various ways. So ARIES is a manuscript submission system. They've got the credit taxonomy as part of their submission um, process. And you can see if you click on this link, you can see how they're using it. 
um, various publishing platforms are already using the taxonomy. So PLOS, before, um, I think last year they implemented, they switched out, they had a five role taxonomy that they were using as part of their uh, manuscript submission system, which they, they operate themselves, I think. Um, and they switched that out and now in mandate the credit, the use of the credit 14, 14 categories. And as far as I understand, I don't know if there's any more from PLOS on the call, but as far as I understand, they're not having any problems with that. Cell Press have also got it in a few of their journals. Um, basically to to encourage I think it's not mandated within cell press but they're not having people complaining and they're also having it the uptake has increased over time um, and the publishing platforms that, that F1000 is working with um, the Welcome Open Research and we're about to launch one with the Gates Foundation and we've just launched another institution one have also got this as a mandated feature in there so they're capturing essentially they are capturing contributions to research outputs that are being published on these platforms um, and this is how it looks. If you look at the bottom, you can't really see probably too well, but basically this is a PLOS paper that has the author contributions captured in that way. So the metadata is absolutely there. You can see these roles being allocated to individuals. And obviously when ORCID is linked to this too, you can easily see how somebody's ORCID, where that somebody on an ORCID, somebody's ORCID profile, somebody is responsible, has, has got a paper linked to them, and this is what they did on that paper. And Mozilla Science Lab has also been working on thinking about how you might visualize that on maybe ORCID or different websites. So whether we can come up with a really nice way of um, visualizing on people's output what they've done. And this paper was published, just to sort of summarize really, this paper was put onto BioArchive, which is a preprint server, um, about I think at the end of last month. It's brilliant to see all those ORCIDs because every single person on that paper has got an ORCID. It's a research publisher's perspective on how to encourage the use of credit and transparency in author contributions on research output papers. I have just commented on this, obviously preprint servers, you can comment on them. So I've just put a comment on there yesterday, uh, essentially saying this is great. It would be really great to have more um, cross sector involvement in this, which, which there always has been, but it would be great for institutions, um, funders and researchers to really get involved in thinking about how they can all help with this, because it's something that will help us all. Building metadata around research outputs is really important for everybody concerned. And I think on that point, I will hand back to Trevor. Happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you very much. And I did promise uh, the speakers they had to answer a question. I'm going to ask my colleague Elizabeth to get ready with the questions from the question box, um, as well as some questions from co-council members that we asked beforehand. Um, now, here I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical surname order. So, Deborah, please. Uh, you did answer before, but just in one quick sentence, what's your answer to, to this question? Can we or should we standardize authorship across disciplines? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a common core of uh, standards that apply across disciplines. We just have to make sure that we don't try to force unique disciplines into one common box. Okay, thank you very much. And Kelly, I'll ask the same question. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, we should focus more broadly on standardizing transparency uh, across mm -hmm. all scientific disciplines. And I think when we do that, uh, we'll move away from authorship and, and move more towards contributorship. Okay, thank you. And Liz? Um, I think I'd agree with both those. Yeah, I agree absolutely with Deborah. One size doesn't always fit all, but often it nearly can. <laughs> Okay, great. So it looks like you're all in agreement. It may be impossible, may be undesirable to impose one standard, but having a common language like through credit could help promote transparency and discussion about authorship, maybe help avoid and even solve disputes in the future. I'm sure the audience wants to know more. Uh, we have about 50, uh, well, just over 10 minutes for Q&A. I'd like to ask Elizabeth, who's pictured here. She's the chair of the COPE Education Subcommittee. Uh, please, could you sort through the questions and present them to us? Elizabeth. Hi, Trevor. Hi, everyone. I think it's uh, lovely to hear all the different opinions. And we've had um, some nice things come in on the questions and people sharing advice. So I'm going to go to a comment from Michael Altus. I hope I'm saying that correctly, Michael, um, who picks up on something that Liz said. 
he disagrees that perfection can be the enemy of the good and he really thinks that perhaps perfection can be the enemy of the excellent. I don't know whether Liz wants to speak a little bit more on, on, on that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good point. I like my cliches. Um, I, th I, I think from my head, there's a lot of reasons why you'd want to know more about contributions. And as someone who was trying to work with the development taxonomy of, of roles in the first place, a lot of people would often argue that a different role would be needed um, when actually they were talking about the same thing. And, and if you could explain it in the in the um, description of, of a term, you can get to most things. Um, but I also am someone very practical. I think there's lots and lots of problems with the current system that actually this would move you forward. And I would rather move forward than talk forever and do nothing. If I could just add, it's Kelly here. Um, I think that we often talk about um, moving forward and, you know, um, creating sort of a better system than we have now, having recognized the limitations of the current system. But I think one thing that we could do better that we're not currently doing with, with much around uh, authorship and publication ethics is actually developing monitoring frameworks and uh, empirical evaluations of the different interventions or new systems that we're trialing. So for instance, uh, to use credit as an example, um, we should be tracking sort of the perceived success of this from a variety of different stakeholders to ensure that we are making progress and that we're not just sort of changing the system to another equivalent or uh, perhaps even worse system. And I would agree with you there. I'm, I've, my background is in, in, I've done a lot of work around science of science. I would absolutely agree with you. Um, and I, I think that is happening within the agencies that are actually using credit. So it would be really good to have information on that. But maybe that again, that is something that COPE could look towards. Um, the only challenge I would say again on that is there isn't a lot of data on what's wrong with the current system either. But we always talk about um, how things aren't working and you know things around impact factors and problems like that. And as someone who's worked in bibliometrics as well, there, there we know that there's a lot of problems and you could spend a lot of time trying to pinpoint things when we know instinctively that there are things that we can explore. Thank you all for your answers. Elizabeth, do we have another question? Yes, we do, Trevor. I think it's for um, published articles. Can we um, retrospectively go back and assign credit? Oh, interesting idea. So this I know that ORCID are looking at credit and how they can implement it. At the moment, there aren't enough um, journals with um, pro prospective collection of these information, but I know they're looking prospectively. I don't know retrospectively. I guess it would be a bit tricky to do that, um, given that you wouldn't be able to retrospectively, unless I've misunderstood what the question is, unless you were, could work out contributions on papers that haven't captured that information. It's essentially if you haven't captured it as part of the metadata during the submission system, you wouldn't be able to very easily get that backwards. Mm. Actually, that's reminded me of a quick question, Liz. Uh, you mentioned metadata, and so this is an important uh, advantage of the credit system, but what kind of uh, technology is needed for other people to, to make that part of it useful? I'm, I'm not the most technical person in the world, so I can try to answer that. I, essentially, I think what happens is if you have, I know Cross, Crossref, for example, are looking at the metadata they capture at the moment, and, and Ginny um, Hendricks is actually leading a big push within Crossref to get better metadata more generally. And one of the things is capturing contributor roles from the publishers that already capture that information. Um, and, and obviously, because credit is fairly standard, it would be something that I think that you would, publishers would push to Crossref as part of their, I think it's their XML feed to Crossref. And if it's in there, it would be part of the metadata. Does that make oh. sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And Elizabeth, any more questions? Yeah, we've got a few questions that came in earlier from Cope Council as well. And I guess if you're part of a large um, multi-authorship group, how can you distinguish who merits acknowledgement and who might merit listing actually as an author? That's a, that's a tricky question. Mm. Um, Liz, do you want to have a go at that one? 
Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm dominating the responses. Uh, yeah, that, that was a, that's a really common common kind of issue, and it's a really realistic one. I think because sometimes you're now seeing on the author list, you're seeing things like case consortia con as, as listed as an author. Um, I'm not sure we can get beyond some of those, you know, things we're using a credit taxonomy necessarily because because there's no specific individual often when it, when someone's part of a consortia. So so I guess it's a case of using it where it makes sense. And maybe I could ask Kelly, what what do you advise in universities with when there's big groups? Uh, yeah, I, I think that it's, it's a great question, and I think Deborah touched on it a little bit in, in her presentation. I think that the key thing is uh, working under the constraints that we have of the existing policy frameworks uh, that apply to us as researchers. The, the best recommendation, I would say, is to have clear standards at the outset of the project, particularly when you're working in these larger groups or consortia, uh, to acknowledge what, mean, what are the criteria for authorship and you know, if you don't meet those, then it would be appropriate to acknowledge anyone who's had a role in the project. But I think that in general, um, you know, the people that conduct the research should be authors or acknowledged. I think that anyone involved in the project has to fill one of those roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I might add, I think this is a real problem for universities. And there are such different cultures. As somebody wearing another hat, I chaired a university-wide tenure and promotion committee for a number of years. And the members of uh, that committee operated with high levels of integrity and good faith most of the time, but they were really challenged by the different cultures and different disciplines. And I think we have a lot of work to do to um, assist in clarifying some of that, some of those problems. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Um, is there any more questions, Elizabeth? We have time for a quick one, a quick question. Um, probably a quick one is whether there is scope to add any additional categories to credit. Ah, good question. So can, is it still at public consultation stage? Can people suggest new terms, make it more granular, alternative? Yes, absolutely. That, that's, what, that's, that's how CASARI, I think, tend to work. So they basically are a standards agency. So if people um, are using it and trying it and it doesn't work, a bit like um, Kelly had suggested, I, I really think you know trying things out, seeing how they work, and if there's feedback, then they can certainly add categories. It's always difficult with dictionaries to kind of keep them, um, you know, useful enough that you feel like there's a time for you to jump in, where without it going to, without it about to change, you know, a couple of months later. So there's always a balance to be struck between you know, making exceptions versus trying to use what's there. Um, but yes, it's it's definitely something that is a is a movable thing. Um, and, and and like I mentioned, I think it's really important research and research outputs, the concept the conceptually are changing really rapidly. Oh great. So the URL you showed before is that the one that people can use and communicate with the group? Well we'll, yes, we'll make a note of, okay. Yeah. yeah, we'll make a note of which URL people can use. Um, um, right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions and also answers. I hope you agree it's been very informative. Uh, we're fast approaching the hour, so our panelists will answer remaining questions offline and will include a summary on the COPE website along with uh, today's recording. And I think it's clear from the presentations and the Q&A that authorship is complex and one size doesn't fit all when it comes to formulating policies but contributorship statements and metadata uh, are a promising start to document who did what and show where credit is due. And it's also clear that a further discussion of authorship standards need all the stakeholders to participate. And COPE, I think, offers a good forum to do that. Actually, after this seminar, uh, you all have a chance to continue this discussion. So please do read and comment on our discussion paper on what constitutes authorship. As I said, COPE will use today's notes plus your feedback to revise this important document. So please leave us your online comments after reading this discussion paper. Please also let us know what you think of today's event in the feedback form that we'll email you in a moment. Uh, we value your opinions and we'll use them when planning more educational events. 
We've now come to the end of this webinar, and I'd like to thank our speakers, Deborah Poff, Kelly Covey, and Liz Allen. Uh, thank you all for sharing your knowledge, Deborah, Kelly, and Liz, uh, your knowledge, experience, and wisdom, and it's been really inspiring, and thank you very much. I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for taking part in COPE's very first webinar, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you've helped make COPE history, and you've given us some ideas for revising the discussion document. So again, please, please give us more ideas by commenting on that discussion paper. Before we go, special thanks go to the people who helped organize today's event. And now in alphabetical surname order, they are Sarah Gilmore, Linda Goff, Elizabeth Moylan, Natalie Ridgway, and Heather Tierney. I hope you can all join us at the next COPE webinar and maybe in the next COPE forum on the 24th of July. Until then, goodbye and good health.